Hello, my name is Christopher Lozinski. This is a tutorial on teaching Python and Jinja 2 in the browser. You can read more at forestwiki.com. And before we get to the exercises, please log in at demo.forestwiki.com during the presentation so we don't all log in at the same time, demo.forestwiki.com. There's a huge difference between learning online and teaching. So learning online is a very solitary activity. You go to some website, maybe there's a video, you do it by yourself. Teaching is very much a group activity and the software needs to not only know Python, it also needs to understand the relationship between the teacher and the student and really there are multiple relationships between the teacher and many students. So it's a much more complex problem. And of course, uh, this talk is to a great extent about teaching, not just software. And if you're talking about teaching, you should really be familiar with the work of Jean Piaget. He was a cis Swiss psychologist um, who worked on child development. And he really helped explain how there's a, in, in epistemology, there's a series of different ideas that we have and each one builds on the previous one. Much like first you have to learn to count and then you can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, uh, geometry, and eventually it goes up to calculus. There's a whole sequence of ideas that you progress through. Um, in fact, I knew a teacher and she, it was tr just tremendous how much she knew about each of her students, not only about what they were thinking, how they were feeling, but even about their parents, their families, their whole environment. And so I'm not actually a teacher, I'm more of a software person, but I want you to keep in mind that the whole skill of teaching is very different from being a software developer. So when we're talking about developing Python in the browser, typically people use Sculpt. There are a large number of Python tools in the browser, I know an awful lot about them. Um, but Sculpt is primarily the ones used for teaching. And of course, the heavyweight in the room is RuneStone Interactive. So they have a large Web2Py application that runs on a server. They've got free, um, you can use the software for free, but they do have to pay their ISP bills. And so what they do is they charge their con for content. So it's $100 a year to subscribe for a class, maybe a school. And um, that's really, prohibitive for many people around the world. They just won't use it. Um, they would let, what they'd like to do is reduce it all to a smaller application, maybe just with an embedded database, SQLite, uh, but they haven't done that yet. Of course, the Forest Wiki already runs as a Docker container with an embedded object-oriented database. The other big company in the Sculpt community is Anvil. So they sell a, a web development environment for Python on the client and the server and it uses Sculpt. And because of that, they've invested heavily in Sculpt. And now shortly, Sculpt is actually gonna start supporting debugging because of the work they're doing. The third company you know about is Ace, not so much for Python development, but for web development. They have all of these gorgeous um, syntax checking editors. I use them extensively for HTML, CSS, JavaScript, SAS, LESS, uh, CoffeeScript, Pug, Jinja, JSON and a hundred other uh, technologies, uh, other ones less, less important for the web. Um, so all of these pieces are, are just wonderful, wonderful chunks of software. Why do we wanna teach Python in the browser? Well, there are benefits and deficits. The big benefit is you only have to do one installation, um, maybe on the teacher's uh, computer, maybe on a, a school server. Um, and after that, you don't have to install it on each of the students' computers. So that just saves an enormous amount of resources, time. And then because it's all online, the teacher can monitor the students' work remotely, right? So that's really important. Um, you just, particularly with COVID, say you have to stay two meters away from somebody, how are you gonna even look at their monitor? So doing it all online makes a lot of sense. And then with everything being done in the web, you don't have to learn shell. So that's another um, get rid of that barrier to learning Python. And of course, the big reason is it's not JavaScript. I don't have that much against JavaScript, 
But for teaching, um, the concepts in Python are really very pure. So it's really good to transmit those concepts to a student. And then later on, if they really have to, they can learn JavaScript as well. Of course, it's not all roses teaching Python in the browser. It does have some problems. Currently, there's no debugger, um, very limited libraries. They have imported all the Python libraries to the client. And sometimes accessing the JavaScript libraries is difficult. And then there are limitations on the editor and the syntax checking. It's not as good as you might get on the server. What you really want to do is you really want to do web development in the browser. They're just, the benefits are overwhelming. Again, you only need one installation. You can monitor the student's work. You have great debuggers, uh, Google Chrome for JavaScript, um, and it also does other languages. Great libraries, great editors, no shell. You know, definitely, and the Forest Wiki is one of the few platforms that actually does both general web development, but also teaches Python in the, in the browser. Okay, so let's get to the turtle syllabus. <clears throat> Basically, I mean, it's really quite simple. You can draw lines, your turtle can move, you can draw shapes, you can, by the end of this, you can do a little house like that. Um, pen up, pen down, background, very simple. Um, but the brilliant thing about turtle is not the rocket science of the Python. It is the emotional impact on its kids. Just look what we can do with it. Turtle graphics. Here's a wonderful. Here's a wonderful spiral, a rainbow, fractals, more triangles, more spirograms, just gorgeous stuff. And you can also do simple paintings. Here we have a snowman, peaks and sunrise, just beautiful stuff. By this point, I hope that everybody in this class is motivated to become a turtle developer. The commands are quite simple. In the left column, you can see the turtle can go right, he can go forward, left or backwards. Middle column, you can create a circle that's kind of hollow. You can create a dot, which is filled with a background color. As a set the background color, go home, go to a position, set the pen color, set the fill color. You can do an awful lot with simple commands. Uh, you can, we, here's how we create a shape, basically begin, fill, end, fill, and draw within that shape. And actually, it's very important to also go to the website for um, the Turtle Library. And there's a ton of other commands if you really want to do something obscure. Before we get to the to actual tutorials, let's speak about Jinja. So Jinja is a templating language. Um, you can see this is a mix of HTML and Jinja, first line HTML, second line, you're starting a loop in Jinja. Third line, it's a mix of both where you're setting the value of the href to be user.url. Fourth line, you're setting the, the username to display and then end, end the list, um, end the for loop and end the UL. Okay, so just, just you know, quite simple. Nothing, no rocket science here. I actually use Jinja very heavily. I built a major site for the United States Green Party. It's now spreading to Europe, particularly United Kingdom. Um, it has some 56 different websites that are run for candidates, for state parties, for local parties. It has national and state maps, and you can either view it as just the Green Party map or the map of supporters, Men Medicaid for all. Green New Deal, Ranked Choice Voting, LGBTQ Rights. So there's a whole bunch of su subdomains, a huge amount of complexity. And so of course I need to use a ton of JSON and I use the Jinja templates to generate um, the JSON. So that's of course trusted Jinja, I, I trust myself. Um, and so that's different from what we're gonna use here. What we're gonna use here is untrusted Jinja where um, I'll be giving other people access to the server even though I don't trust and they could potentially do something malicious. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, first let's understand we're actually running on top of an object graph database. So in the Django world, you're talking about uh, relational databases and you're doing some object models on top of that with some object relational mapping. You could probably do this in Django as well. The only thing is this is, well, okay. This is optimized for this approach, this database. 
Um, so it's actually a graph of Python object, persistent Python objects. Um, the simple approach is we just look at it as a tree. 95% of the time, people don't even know it's a graph. So I can describe it to new people. Just think of it as a file system. OK, so how do we do Jinja to security? Well, if I give somebody access to one part of the graph, they can navigate up the tree, navigate to the other users, modify things, delete stuff, cause all kinds of trouble. right? So, so that's not going to work. Jinja has a sandbox, but you still have to be careful about what content you give people access to. So here, let's take a look at the user three um, in a different color now. And what I do is I just, when they, there, when an un, there's trusted Jinja and untrusted Jinja. When the untrusted Jinja tries to access a branch of the tree, first it makes a copy of that branch, and then it can make whatever changes it wants to those, but those changes won't show up on the, on the actual tree. And Jinja has a sandbox too, which also provides some security. I'm sure that any serious hacker could, like some of my friends who I only talk to um, on tour, I'm sure they could break in. But you know, for people who are just learning Python, it's good enough. And particularly, you know, the key is they should be focused on getting their homework done, not on hacking the system. Couple, so it's really, so it's on this object database. It's really hard for people to get it. And the object database is very different from a file system. And let me give this very nice example of images. In the upper left half corner, we have the force wiki. You can reach it at image logo. You can reach it at slash logo. And, but when you're actually doing some websites, maybe you don't want the full size logo. Maybe you just want 50, you know, maximum width, 50 pixels wide, 100 pixels wide, 150, 200 wide. So I do, the, I do these kind of things all the time and I have hundreds of images and I don't want to go and re manually recreate all my images of a different size, forget it, I'd go nuts. Um, so what I do is I, this just, um, I traverse to the object, I traverse to the logo, I traverse to its children. You can see the URLs down below. You could think of this very much as pyramid traversal. Um, it, it uses much of the pyramid software. And if that object, if that smaller, child object doesn't exist under the parent image, then it actually generates and then it caches it in the object database. So the next time it doesn't have to regenerate it, it generates it with Python imaging library pill. So we have a parent image, the original image, and then its children are these smaller versions of the image, right? And so kind of not at all clear how you do this on a file system, but an object graph database, it's just obvious. Okay, so let's move on to the turtle and ginger exercises. By now, I hope everyone's logged into demo.forestwiki.com. And uh, if you haven't, please go ahead. What we're going to do is we're going to break up into small groups of five. Um, and then we'll go through the exercises. We won't be returning to this. I will just conclude the talk. At the end of the talk, I'll just do some closing comments at the end of the exercises. So we're, this is the end of the video. Thank you very much.